Hello everyone, this is Vishal Krishna, the founder and editor of the UpstreamLife.com. We're all going to be voting next week and uh, India is coming up to a general election and we will decide who's the prime minister and who's not going to be the prime minister. That's the interesting thing. But okay, what is this podcast all about? Pawan and I have been doing these videos. We've done something on the budget. We're going to do this regularly on what built India. We're going to talk with data. Data does not lie. Data does not contradict. And so we've curated a nice podcast around data. We're also going to put out this data that we've curated as a separate slide which you can access on the website. So go vote wisely and I have with me Pawan, Pawan Sharma, the founder, the co-founder or the partner at BCL India. BCL India is also a firm that advises me and you know they help startups. Let's all, I'll put it that way. But Pawan, what's the podcast about today? Uh, it's about a lot of data, how India has progressed over the last 10 years. We are looking at multiple data points. We are looking at what are the challenges that we could see. And like you rightly said, we need to vote wisely. So hopefully this helps. And by the way, in this topic, we cover about climate change. India's climate change is real. The center versus tax, versus yeah, state, state tax, tax yeah. debate is real. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot more in between. We talk about wealth education, and everything. Wealth education, wealth, wealth. A lot of things. Yeah. And how we've done well with all those yeah. constraints. I hope you all like it. You will like it, guys. So <laughs> thank you. Enjoy it. Pawan, how are you? Very good, thank you. Pawan, so Pawan, thank you so much. This is our second time together in this uh, humble studio of ours. <laughs> and uh, we have to do more because we, we are data-led at BCL. Yeah. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, Pawan's been my mentor for a long time and he advises my company. But he's also a man of data and he will tell you how political economy works in this country. So we are going to talk about taxes now and we are also going to talk about income and wealth inequalities in India and the challenges to the India growth story and the positive aspects of the India growth story. I want to start with this. When I look at the TV, or I seldom watch TV, but when I switch it on, it's always about a state asking the center to release their tax money, right? And that's, let's put the first segment as tax sharing between center and states. And on that note, I want to say there's a certain opposition party as they walk through the streets of Bangalore, they're giving out pamphlets saying, you know, Karnataka has paid the highest amount of GST and we have not got that money back. That is, is it true? It is to some extent. Okay. So maybe we should understand how tax revenue shared between center and states. That will give some background. And regardless of the party in power in the center, regardless. this is always the problem, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. The center does not compensate the state. Absolutely. And regardless of the p party in power Absolutely. there. It's right? not about the party. Let mm. us look at the mechanics. How is money shared between the center and states? Okay. And um, what are the what are the levers that mm. center can pull? Right? Okay. So if you look at the way money is shared between center and states, uh, the formula is set by the finance commission. All right. Uh, so the 15th Finance Commission is what we are referring to for mm -hmm. this year. The period mostly is 2020 to 2025. Right. That is a period of, and the Finance Commission has a recommendation. Okay. So the recommendation states what is the amount of money in as far as the central government's tax share is concerned. And when I say tax share of the central government, I'm referring to income tax, which goes straight to the center. Mm. CGST, that's mm. the central government's share of GST, mm. because SGST and uh, SGST share in IGST goes straight to the state. So we're looking at taxes that are collected by the center. Mm -hmm. How is that money shared with the states? So one, uh, the first point being that there is a cap of 41%, mm -hmm. which means 41% of the total tax that is collected by the center has to be shared with the states. Now the question is how do they share the money with individual states? Mm -hmm. And that is where the Finance Commission's recommendation comes into play. All right. So the Finance Commission has a formula. Mm -hmm. There are different weightages that are given to how a state is performing what is its income distance is yeah. the one that has the criteria is income distance, Correct. population, area, um, ecology, ecology, tax, tax, efforts. tax effort, income, demographic performance. Income distance being the one that has the highest weightage. Hmm. Income distance is the difference between the average per capita income hmm. and the state's per capita income. Okay. So if a state's per capita is much lower than the average, the finance commission naturally believes to bring everybody to the same plane, you need to you know give them more money. Yes. And the principles have always been equality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or I'd say equanimity, right? People should be should get enough money mm. so that their income levels can increase so that their lifestyle can get better. Now I get the point now. Uh, therefore, Karnataka is not getting much because the, probably the center believes that uh, our income... Income distance is less, yeah. right? So if you look at the states, southern states, not just Karnataka, you look at Karnataka, Kerala, Andhra, Telangana, and mm. uh, Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu especially. If you look at these states, 
the share that they get from the center's kitty is much lower compared to what they contribute. Okay. Right. So, uh, so first is the finance commission's recommendation: forty-one percent of the total mm-hmm. collection goes to st- states, and each state would get based on their respective yeah. performance. And now, if you look at what money the state is getting, if you look at uh, Kerala, um, I, I'll keep looking at this data Please point. Please do. We should look at data point because there's too much data. So Believe me, when you're running a country like India, you have to look at data. You have to look at <laughs> So it. if you look at the state like Kerala, mm-hmm. it gets back 60 paisa for every rupee that mm-hmm. is contributed by its people. If you look at Karnataka, it gets 17 paisa back. So, okay. Here's for the, every rupee it contributes. Here's the difference. Kerala gets 0. 0.60 paisa okay. for every rupee, rupee. contributed. Correct. We get only 0.17 or Correct. 17 paise. Maharashtra gets 8 paise. When I say we, it's Karnataka. We have yes. domiciled in Karnataka <laughs> and Bangalore. So Maharashtra gets only 0.08. 0.08. 8. 0. 0. 8. 0. 8. 8 for every rupee that it contributes. Right? 0. 0.08. Why is that? That is how the Finance Commission's recommendation uh, on the formula works out, right? And this is not just the trouble. The other trouble is also if you compare the hmm. recommendations uh, for 15th Finance Commission, hmm. 10th Finance Commission, southern states have seen a drop in their share just based on the formula. Right. right. So one is how much money comes from the center to the state, there's a drop. If you compare the money you're getting with your contribution to the center, again, there yeah. is a disparity. See, because tax, see, money to the central government will have to come from taxes. Yeah. Taxes yeah. are paid by people. Mm-hmm. And people don't fall from sky, right? They're part of a state. Correct. Right? So if you look at a state, the state is saying, my people are contributing X. I'm getting a very small fraction of it. And I need more. Only then could I deploy more, right? So it is not an unfair ask. Okay. I'll add two more points to it. Which, yes. Uh, it's it's uh, like these great clouds on the conversation, right? Two more points. One, cess and surcharge. They are components of taxes collected by the center, which is not shared with the state. Only the base tax, that is either the base income tax or base GST, is collected and shared. Like the surcharge. corporate tax is corporate 22%. Tax, income tax, 22 and then you have surcharge and cess. Yes. 22 is shared, surcharge and cess is not shared. They are not required to share. Okay. Again, not the party that is in power currently, any party for that mm-hmm. matter. You are not required to share cess and surcharge. Mm-hmm. The well, amount the that has been, been collected asking. over the last five years, surcharge and cess is close to 37 lakh uh, crore. If you see that number, it's a substantial mm-hmm. sum. Second thing is that it, the share of cess and surcharge is also increasing in the total mm. tax kitty. So it's close to 20% now. Some reports say it's more than 20%. Mm. So if you're looking at the total tax collection, 20% mm. of it goes straight to the center. And the center then can devise any scheme that it wants. It is free to do that without the need to send that money back to states. The last point being, even the money that the states have had to get, mm. they've had to basically you know beg for it mm. and... In the last five years, 3.7 lakh crore has to still come to the states. It is still pending with the central government. So even what you have to get, you're not getting. Okay. Narrative-wise, for the people to understand, is it right for, for the opposition to say that the money should come? Or is it... Or that, because I see the narrative being used saying that, okay, the party, the, the central government is being kind to its own party who... Who has power in states, rather? I right? will not buy that. Would that be the argument? No, no, no it is not true because mm. if you look at states like, um, yeah, let's take Rajasthan, or if you take even states like Gujarat, if you take Maharashtra, mm. well, let's say Gujarat, Rajasthan, they have also not benefited. Mm. They have also been at the wrong end of the stick. You know, they have not received the funds that they need to get. Mm. But uh, the other challenge being, if you see the disparity. Right. If you look at the uh, maybe a chart you need to put up you know, yes. so that people, I'm going to your put this chart up. Right? So if you look at uh, the the bottom end of the graph, in addition to the southern states, you also have Gujarat. Yeah. For every rupee it contributes, it gets only twenty six paisa back. Okay. That's interesting. So yeah. we have to look at the data, ladies and gentlemen. Pawan is absolutely right. Instead of saying yes, this party is not in power in the state, and therefore the center is uh, playing, uh, giving us a stepmotherly treatment is actually not true when you look at the data. Yeah. Because in the past, you had the same government in power and the same government in power in the state, center and state, but money has not come to the state. Uh, yeah, so the, the challenge, of course, here that we have to see is, you know, irrespective of the party. Maybe something needs to be done about the formula. Mm. So if you look at a state like Bihar, mm. so every rupee it contributes, it's getting seven rupee back. Oh, we are getting at, seven rupees. If you look at Uttar Pradesh, seven rupees. That's seven, seven, that seven times. Seven times uh, of what your regardless of your contribution. That means other other states are subsidizing. Exactly. 
If you look at Uttar Pradesh, wow. it's getting, I think, 2.8, mm. 2.5, sorry, 2.5. So every rupee contributes. This time's budget, the amount of money that Gujarat has got is higher than all f- the states, southern states combined. Mm. So naturally, you know, there would be uh, mm. a, an issue raised out of this, right? But maybe something has to be done about the formula, irrespective mm. of who is in power, right? Can you cap the share? Can mm. you say that uh, as the state's share should not go beyond five, mm. beyond six? Mm. Or can you say... X amount of all tax share has to be distributed equally Mm -hmm. and anything in excess will be shared based on a formula. Okay, this is what I want to ask you. I'm going to put out these slides, ladies Mm -hmm. and gentlemen, the 15th Finance Commission's recommendations. You will see how much uh, the states need to be paid. You will also see tax contribution versus tax devolution. You will also see tax contribution versus tax devolution in terms of how much rupee uh, each state gets back for every rupee, how much paise it gets back. You will see that. So, But I want to ask you, when you say Tamil Nadu and Kerala mm. have seen the steepest decline in share in divisible mm. pool, explain that because that is going to be the second graph that they're going to be seeing. Right. Now that is compared to the 10th Finance Commission. Yeah. If you compare the 10th Finance Commission to the 15th Finance Commission, a lot of time has passed between these two finance commissions. But based on the formula itself, mm. you would see that Tamil Nadu and Kerala, their share based on the formula has dropped. Now, th- now your that is one. The second, of course, is how much are you contributing versus how much you're getting. Mm-hmm. Third is your share in the surcharge and cess. Mm-hmm. And the fourth point being is that even based on this formula, what more money I had to get, I shouldn't have to ask for it multiple times. It, yes. should, it should flow to me. Yeah, absolutely. That's a third question. Straight, yes. right? um, maybe one of the points that we need to bring up here is also the HDI, mm-hmm. right? which, is, uh, which is important. And yeah. that is the argument that some of these states are okay. putting forth. Before we move to HDI, because you've designed this uh, interview beautifully, because at this at the center and the state, you know, the fight that they're having for generations now, it goes back to ancient times also. If you read that book, uh, you know, uh, Lords of the Deccans or whatever, or the Deccan Sultans or whatever, it shows that India Indian emperors it was all, were always biased towards the northern emperors in terms of storytelling. It's very interesting. Mm. So therefore the states in the Indeed. south don't like, or other states don't like everything going to Indeed. Delhi. It's interesting, right? So I want to talk about, so the, the tax versus the state is always, the center and the, the central taxes, state taxes, and the fight between the center and the state is real, but it's been happening for generations it's, regardless of the party. Yes. And at the center of all this is the Human Development Index, right. which, uh, uh, which which states like Karnataka want addressed, right? At this yeah, point so of if time. You look at the, and this is possible only if they get that money back. No, what they're saying is that <coughs> you look at the way my state is performing mm. and mm. let us take HDI as one of the metrics. Mm. If you take the state of Kerala, doing exceptionally well when it comes to HDI. HDI is a composite index. Mm. Uh, looks at healthcare, education and per capita income, right? So if you look at the southern states, they're doing very well. Mm. If you look at some of the northern states, they're not doing so well. Okay. Now the question is, is the gap increasing? Or is the gap narrowing? Hmm. If the gap is increasing, then no matter how much money you give to the state, it will not yield any results. Hmm. So should you peg the contribution to the state to an HDI index? Absolutely, right? Important. Let's take this example. Ka- Kerala, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka do yeah. reasonably well in the HDI, yes. Human Development Index. Yes. If you look at even America, the schools are compensated based on performance. Hmm. Schooling system. Hmm. So don't you think if we are, if each state and their municipalities and districts are contributing to the HDI and, and that's improving, don't you think they need more money? No, ideally, that's how the fo- that's Correct. how maybe the formula could be, the 16th Finance Commission has just been uh, mm. commissioned. So mm. maybe this should be a factor that they can consider because education, especially, and this is what we'll discuss later mm. on, right? You need to invest in education today. Mm. We are seeing some disastrous results. It's mm. only going to get worse unless we invest. Yeah. So could you incentivize states that invest in education where HDI is higher, they have more money, you're creating a better future for the citizens of that state. Rather than taking money away from that state, giving it to another state that's not been performing well. Yeah, don't give freebies. So now here's the point. Okay, say states that are doing well don't get that tax Mm. money. But how when they divert it to a state that's not doing well, say like BR, like Mm. you said, for every rupee contributed, they get seven times Mm. the money. How should they use that money? It shouldn't be a freebie. There should be some thing pegged to them, right? Yeah, so freebie, let us discuss this uh-huh. right now. How do you, what is a freebie? Now, will you call the government's responsibility to the society a freebie or what is given in excess? Okay. Right? So if you look at 
the central scheme let's take the pm kisan mm. samman yojana right mm. where every farmer is getting about 6000 rupees per mm. that's money given rolled out to the farmers maybe that was done to keep up the promise of increasing the mm. farmers income doubling the farmers income right otherwise it's very difficult yeah. to meet that number that is basically free money you know mm. going to the farmer the objective of course is they will use it for other purposes now take the state of karnataka mm. you have the state government which has a lot of schemes mm. one of them being the anna bhagya right which is the food subsidy yes. central government also has a food subsidy you know it is again shocking to me that close to i think 50 to 60% close to 60% of india depends on food subsidy mm. it's a shocking number now do you call that a freebie or a necessity i feel it is a necessity it is a necessity now where do you draw the line as far as food is concerned education is concerned they are all necessities but putting additional income in the hands of people when they may not need it hmm. giving them services that which they may not need hmm. uh, is dangerous it is dangerous now the farmers part i agree yeah. the below poverty line argument i agree people who need food that is an intervention or a subvention even in many cases Correct. i agree with you so that they can they can track measure but it cannot be a freebie like they give to youth yeah that is a problem see yes. if you're giving x amount of money to unemployed youth now what is the incentive for the system to skill them mm-hmm. make sure that they can be employed some day absolutely right they and contradict where does the themselves. money come from they contradict themselves by saying we'll give you 10000 every month and plus we'll reskill you yeah, i i i it's I, a contradiction know, right? because if i get paid 10000 i will say okay i've got some land and some income maybe and why should i even go reskill myself yeah so may, that money should have been put to use to skill them maybe to improve our infrastructure teachers mm. maybe better institutions i don't know where the money is going to come see then these pamphlets that you refer yeah. to right everybody is speaking about benefits that will go to the citizen mm. not many people are speaking about how it will be funded how will it come yes correct i have seen that money going i have seen from? india bo- fiscal the fiscal deficit has gone higher we are borrowing heavily we, we, see many countries borrow mm. many countries have a very high fiscal deficit or uh, the advantage india has is that we don't depend on external funding or it's mm. internal debt which is manageable but the mm. question is still debt right it still puts a lot of pressure on the system now while you can go ahead and make these promises where is the money going to come from it'll come from the middle classes right no, but no even if it is middle you can't tax them to death we are going to talk about that exactly. because the indian middle classes really don't earn that much yeah. so we'll talk about that and that is a stark reminder right. a lot of reports say that uh, indians there are more than 400 million indians who earn 37 or more earn more than 30 lakhs per annum but that is Five not so yeah. that is not true not right not true there are some it's too it's uh, different num- different reports giving so we have the right numbers about 400 million indians earn only 165000 per it's year a, it's a crazy number it's yeah. a crazy number only that much and therefore you are right the middle classes can could have been shrunk maybe Correct. that 50 million will be taxed more and how much can you tax them yeah because yeah. they will stop contributing and they are also your voter base hmm. right no government irrespective of the party will hmm. tax the voter base to an extent where they start protesting so it's an interesting point you are saying that spend money but spend money that is transparent that brings people into the formal workforce or at least gives them a chance to contribute to the economy rather than giving them a freebie where they don't do anything you you are free to spend money the way you want provided it it helps you build a better society right you are either investing for the future or consuming okay today freebies are hmm. more about consumption yes again there some are necessities food is a necessity right during covid you had to release yes. food yes. that i agree that's a that necessity but now beyond the necessity mm. if you keep putting money mm. into consumption mm. versus investments for the future we are creating a disaster for ourselves no i agree I by that so in this segment basically we are talking about the tussle between center and states for the tax money and how they put that tax money to use you'll have to understand that beyond the narratives of politics uh, money should be put to good use number okay. one and states that already have a good income uh, distribution they don't need that money because their their people are doing well mm-hmm. and maybe we are trying to be a subsidizing states that are really low in income to get to the formal economy faster and that is where the politics comes in right in both ways one is we say that we are doing very well and why why don't we get our money why should that person yeah. that state which was which is not doing very well why should they get the money but they need it because we are talking about the country as a whole and the center has to steer that but, but between that is, is where much? the politics is yeah. and how much the question is how much correct second thing is the constitution gives the state certain rights mm-hmm. uh, one of it is how they want to spend mm-hmm. money right now 
you can't have the central government sabotaging that right by collecting money through ways that are not to be distributed. For example, cess and surcharge mm. ultimately goes to the center. Center, of course, releases schemes. And then the tax money, only 40% comes to us. Huh? 41% is the cap. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it is with the center. You also have cess and surcharge. They will come in the form of central schemes. You know, it's strange, right? India has always been about its mothers. Most of the sons and daughters give their mothers the money and they become the central purse uh, to control the house. I mean, just jokes apart, that's how it runs also. Yeah, I hope that changes. I hope that changes in a way, right? And therefore, I think this tussle won't end. It will not end. It will not end until there is there are leaders who understand economics and finance, transparency, and that takes a long time. It will take time. Okay. And which is why it's more important to invest in the future. Okay. Right. So, absolutely. And that's where... Don't give freebies. Invest in income and reducing the reducing the income gap by training people to go work. Correct. Giving them a chance to become better, and don't pay them to sit at home. Correct. That's all. And this yeah. is for youth, yeah. and for the people who are older. That, you can again, do the some question is, is it a necessity? Right? Yes. It becomes a necessity because beyond a point, you cannot expect them to be working. For example, Singapore. Yes. You are expected to work till you die. Absolutely. Right? Now, do you want such a state? That's mm -hmm. not ideal. It could you give them pensions? I'm all for pensions, sure. right? But should you give money into the hands of youth when they are graduating? In the prime of their life, yes. No. Shouldn't they be going and searching for jobs? But the question is, are there jobs? Absolutely. Right? I would rather give free meals and give them training. Training, rather. yes, yes. But the other question is jobs, right? Which we'll come to later on. Yes. If there are no jobs being created, mm. then this becomes a necessity. Okay. Because you can't have people on the street. Okay, I want to go into the second segment. Uh, by the way, this entire presentation, we'll try to put in the end of the show or try to fit in the presentation, the gaps where you can understand the data. Okay, uh, now moving into wealth classes in mm -hmm. India. A certain report came out a few, a month ago and said that, you know, there will be 715 million Indians by 2030 earning between 5 to 30 lakhs. Mm -hmm. Huge distribution. Mm -hmm. Would that be accurate, number I, one? I want to start there, quickly. I am not too sure uh, because I'm getting different numbers from because different sources. Because you looked at various sources Correct. and you find there is... Uh, there's a huge gap. There is a huge gap I between would, everything. I, I'd really like for this to be true, mm -hmm. right? I'd have more and more Indians earning more money, mm -hmm. right? And falling within the 5 to 30 lakh bracket. Mm -hmm. But you also have other reports where the numbers are not this optimistic. Mm -hmm. Now... Would this translate into a reality? I hope. But mm. even if you look at this data, there's a couple of other interesting points, right? Mm. If you look at what is happening is a redistribution between the 1.25 to 30 lakh. Mm. So you're breaking that class into two subsets, up to 5 lakhs and 5 lakh to 30 lakh. Mm -hmm. And there's a movement happening within this group. Mm. Beyond this, if you see uh, people are earning beyond 30 lakh, and that number is increasing sharply. Mm. So if you see the projections, it will increase by 3x. Mm. Every 10 years. It is a sharp jump, right? <laughs> Which I would agree yeah. with you. India has changed over the last 10 years. We are dressing differently. My, uh, my cameraman and uh, producer, he dresses very differently. And I'm sure 10 years ago, none, none of us dressed up like that. Even me, I wear Star Wars t-shirts <laughs> for podcasts. That's true, right? Yeah. India has changed. And you are very patriotic, by the way. <laughs> you've, you've remained the old way. But, but it is true. A lot of Indians are consuming a lot. Okay. But the 30 lakhs bracket per year, how much is it today according to you? Is it? You so, told me five years ago that only one million Indians earn more than thirty lakhs. Uh, not even thirty. I'm saying if you let us say if you're earning more than a lakh a year, mm -hmm. a month, mm -hmm. that is twelve lakh per year. Yes, you are in the top ten percent of India, right? So it is that stark. So if you're looking at the top ten percent of India, right, and by just earning a lakh, if you look at the data distribution, maybe we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's mm -hmm. another slide, maybe that you'd need to put, right? So if you see that income distribution. We are looking at close to 461 million Indians mm -hmm. who are earning only 70,000 per year. Mm -hmm. You are looking at 369 million Indians who are earning only 1.65 lakh per year. If you add up these two, it is close to 800 million. And their income is less than 1.65 lakh per year. Mm -hmm. It is a crazy number, right? And if you're earning a lakh a month, like I said, you're in the top 10. Mm -hmm. It is... Uh, it is that hard, at least, for the large majority of our population mm. to even reach a lakh a month. Right? Okay, let so, me give them some numbers. Hmm. Uh, people earning, okay, let's take ceiling fans. Let's take these yeah. items, right? Ceiling fans, people earning one, you know, one lakh twenty, one lakh twenty-five thousand per year. Yeah, ninety percent. So ninety percent of them own ceiling fans. Yeah. Okay, the same bunch, only thirty-four percent of them own two-wheelers, right? right? Uh, the same bunch only. 
but it's interesting 55% of them own TVs correct when TVs are TVs and phones will be mainstream right. now they are everyone's consuming yes. content uh, refrigerator only 21% or uh, and that's a huge segment right? and car don't even ask it's 1% 1%. or below air condition it's 2% <laughs> interestingly <laughs> but i'm saying <laughs> india has stark numbers man yeah. right so the and then if you look exactly. at the middle classes right i mean people let's say i'm going to bunch bunch that whole 5 lakh to 30 lakh as a middle class and that's where everybody is betting on because they are the ones who own ceiling fans they are 70% of them own two wheelers and right? ultimately they are your consumers yeah and future. that's the reason everyone's coming into india because that's a huge class would it be 100 million say easily easily right much that's more right 12 lakhs so you look at a much say, uh, indian earning 12 lakhs would be much higher should be yes so, yes. so, so you're looking so, at even if you look at the uh, data point that we mm, refer to now mm. right you're looking at close to 9 crore right so you're looking at about 92 million 92 million Indi- uh, indians that's great man yeah earning at least that's you know, like a, a population of 3 5 5 6 countries so, and that is what is attracting a lot of capital mm-hmm. you know at least uh, that is the hope that mm. india will become a massive consumer market it already is okay right. now how more. many how many people will be added to the new middle class i mean you were saying that this will increase right it will so the expectation is at least mm. that uh, it will grow by 65% upward mm-hmm. movement and there are two movements that we are looking at right one is from lower middle to upper middle you'd see a significant jump mm. there close to 60 65% true mm. but the middle class to rich you'd see a 10% jump mm. but uh, that number itself is so big mm. you know the movement from middle class to rich even a 10% move so it's a push right it's mm. an upward migration and that itself will take the number of rich you know by 3x every okay. 10 years right because of our population you're going to see some huge numbers being moved up oh, between all these numbers what is also important is poverty right that's one point we need to touch how many people are still in bpl today it is less than i think uh more than 3 4% if you're looking at real poverty rate, mm. it's a small small number mm. and a huge percentage of them have moved out and that is something that is good last 10 years last 15 and hence years. india's consumption story yes and that's why you're looking at this upward shift right you're looking at uh, the population moving from poor mm. to lower middle upper middle and rich right and that's something good that we have done we have certainly done something good okay pawan when i sit with you there's so much data and i think people listening to listening to this podcast also would be worried now saying how do we access this data we are going to put it in the bcl india website yeah. it'll also be on the upstreamlife.com's yeah. website there you can access it you can open the pdf first i would recommend and then compare everything that we speak and then agree and disagree and agree to disagree also <laughs> we'll be happy if you agree to disagree uh we are setting the context mm. for the elections and where has india come in 10 years uh, it's a story of uh, you know the gst working lots of tax being collected but some states who have paid a lot more in taxes want their money back but some but the center is giving it to states that need it and rightly so we are a union we have to share it like brothers and sisters but in between is the politics i understand it uh, the numbers are staggering yeah sometimes difficult to understand but i would recommend it because uh, pawan and team have really worked hard to put it together they've also given you various sources so you can look at those sources too nothing is concocted by the way yeah, we are not politicians <laughs> we are setting the context for you we are only cynical yes we are only cynical <laughs> and we try to be positive we are business people also yeah. okay every investor is coming to india for consumption it's a consumption story mm. they say okay, indians are going to consume like we said 92 million middle class today people earning between 1 to 1 uh, say 12 lakhs plus every year uh, they are the top 10% of the country's uh, you know spending bracket and that's what they're investing in and it's going to grow so let's look at some numbers of household consumption expenditure how would you read it i think it has increased savings mm. have decreased okay and the gap between urb, urban and rural has also dropped if i am am i correct in saying that uh, more or less yes okay so you want to talk about this please so see so the household consumption expenditure survey was released mm. recently mm. and there are some very interesting numbers if you see uh, 2022 23 and you compare it with 10 years mm-hmm. uh, back right each each of these points so one thing that's clear is that we are spending more mm-hmm. uh, both rural india as well as urban india um, mm-hmm. it is good it's uh, typical of any growing country you're consuming more So if you see the uh, money that uh, rural India is spending it's almost 2x of what it used to spend the last 10 years. Mm. So every month on an average rural India is spending close to 3700 rupees urban India is spending close to 6500 rupees. Of course this is the 95% mm. of the group 
they balance 5% if you see urban india they are spending close to 25000 rupees per month mm-hmm. uh, rural india would be spending close to 7500 rupees a month right okay so this is expenditure which is bracketed into two heads mm-hmm. food non food we'll discuss yeah. them separately uh, what is interesting is that the gap between urban spending and rural spending is narrowing mm. which is good right which means that uh, rural india is catching up I mean, they have just as much access and aspiration aspiration as urban india which means a lot of uh, the d2c brands can we were just talking they, about positioning right. and you know they can bring international quality shoes locally Possibly, uh, but yes. made in india yes. that's a story that yes. can happen so from a business point of view yes. it makes a lot of sense which means rural india is willing to spend now mm-hmm. so that becomes a huge opportunity the second thing is again southern states are spending 25% more than northern states it's interesting right i always thought we idli consuming those are consuming <laughs> people who not spend a lot more but it's interesting to see that yeah. means because there's more wealth in the south more wealth, exactly. so most of the tech companies are here tech companies and maybe historically too you have got ports right mm. so maybe you were the first to get um, uh, globalized Absolutely. right which is true actually uh, yeah, on both sides right so with there is a historical reason to it. you would know this better than me yes right so it's it's uh, chennai that started yeah. everything chennai bombay and kerala and then right, bombay is the deccan but you yeah. know it's central india but still so yeah you have a history yeah. it, right so you would have a lot of wealth in the south yes. and naturally you would spend absolutely i agree with you so if you think that the south indian does not spend believe me think twice we are spending a lot yeah. more okay let's see how indians spend their yeah. money on food right uh there's a 10% drop in food yes. in overall mpce you want to explain that so this is again very interesting uh, and also typical of a growing mm-hmm. country mm-hmm. where your preference moves towards non food mm-hmm. expenses right so the food budget has dropped mm-hmm. so it used to be 59 60% of rural india's budget it is now 46 mm-hmm. if you look at urban it used to be 48 it is 39 okay. so sharp drop in both cases but again within the food expenditure if you see cereals mm-hmm. they have dropped sharply if you see rural india is to spend close to 22% mm-hmm. it's now 4.8 but 22 was on a base of 60 4 is on a base of 46 it's it's so dark man i i don't know what so i think people this. are not consuming their mm-hmm. cereals and vegetables their spinach Possibly. you know that's what you know actually they say to live healthy have good spinach yeah. and vegetables but even vegetables have dropped i look yeah. at the numbers you highlighted it in the presentation you will see pavan highlighting these beverages have gone up yeah, which means people are going to be unhealthy <laughs> right that's even in rural and yes. in urban urban it's 10.64 yes and 10.64 mm-hmm. on a base of 40 which is 25% which means you're spending more money on processed food and beverages mm-hmm. as compared to you know in 2000 if you see it is 6 but 6 is on a base of 46 right so as far as percentages are concerned it occupies a much larger percentage of the spending both rural as well as indian uh, as well as urban it's, it's right? interesting even our protein consumption hasn't grown by that much yeah, you have milk, which is really milk crazy products, yeah milk products yes yeah, even that they have I mean, meat that's plattered all yeah. that's the same egg meat. fish meat it's plattered yes right? so we don't know what these numbers next 10 years It's interesting means that means we will consume more again going to mostly IPL and these uh, you know soccer leagues or whatever but we have to produce the talent to go to these leagues we'll come to that we have it's to come to that in a bit dark a number it's a and education <laughs> yeah let's look on at education yeah, non food is, is dropped yeah that is sad. and that is very sad. sad in a land of saraswati yeah which is what indians used to pride themselves on that every indian regardless of their religion would pride themselves on and education so if you see these numbers it's dropped from 8 to 6% mm-hmm. now it would mean two things right one we are not and this is despite the fact that the cost of education has increased yes right naturally just considering inflation in education this percentage should have gone up mm-hmm. in the household budget it's dropped two things are possible one we were spending less on education mm-hmm. the second possibility is also that right to education is yielding results right that mm-hmm. you're now getting education at a much cheaper cost deeper into india hmm. that is a possibility you can't write that off okay similarly with cereals as well it is possible that the right to food hmm. is yielding results right you don't have to spend enough money because you're getting that from the government it's interesting so we have to within this state a point see that the government also spends on Correct. the the what midday meal schemes Correct. right those schemes are around so so we'll have to go deeper into the data hmm. and see hmm. compared to year 2000 and hmm. now what is the impact of the government's intervention hmm. if they are yielding results which means that 
individuals have more money in their hand to spend. Mm. So they would be spending on conveyance. You see the sharp increase in mm. conveyance? I see that. Conveyance but they've spent less on studies. Yeah, but is it? That's but it, it could be in government schools. They Possibly. may be sending. The, they they may still be going to. That means the share of private uh, schools in rural areas is small. Maybe yes. we don't know. We'll have to go deeper into the data. But uh, there's been an increase in durable goods. Traveling a lot. Indians are spending more on durable goods. It's a sharp increase. And there's a enormous spend on entertainment, which is interesting. <laughs> which means smartphone entertainment. Yeah. I hope it's not those. Uh, you know those gaming apps. I just, you know I I seriously hope the you know the gambling apps that we all talk about anyway. Uh, it's interesting though. Yes. This is what this is how this is the reason at least from a context of the Indian middle class and the you know and we are going to add more into the middle class soon by the next ten years. You know it's probably double, and that's where everybody thinks that India is going and to and we're spending more, so it's a massive market. And again, to spend so much, they should be working. Correct. It's such a contradiction because we were talking about the HDI where some states really need to reskill their people. And, and the North is younger than the South. Uh, so, Demographic. Yes, you know, you need income to spend. Hmm. Uh, maybe we'll have to get into demographic wise spending. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that data is available. Hmm. This is from the Ministry of Statistics. Okay. Uh, they have released one part of the report. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the follow-up parts are far more detailed. Mm -hmm. And if they can give an age-wise spend, that will be fantastic. Okay. Now, let's go into savings. Yeah. An interesting aspect. Uh, many years ago, 2007-8, when I used to write about uh, the insurance sector, they would say that India would save 33% of its income uh, you know, as savings. It's saved. And they're not putting it in any financial asset, but it's saved in a bank account or something. But what has changed since? So, what is the, how is the new India saving? India is saving more money in financial assets. Mm -hmm. So, we see that increase mm -hmm. very clearly. So, if you see the amount of money, that amount of wealth that India owns in financial assets, it's close to 10%. Okay. But what we have also seen over the last, uh, I'll say, five years, is that the gross saving rates is dropping. Mm -hmm. Now, within the gross, gross saving rate is a combination of corporate and household saving rate. Right? But if you look at household saving rate alone, you would see again there is a drop. It's, there's been a sharp drop post-COVID. Hmm. Now, one of the arguments is that it is possible that, see, when you look at the household saving rate, hmm. you're looking at net financial assets. Uh, you, have, of course, have physical assets too. If you look at the net financial asset piece, that hmm. has dropped from 11% to 5%. It's, it's a sharp drop. Now, that is possible if the liabilities increase, right? So, net financial asset is asset minus liability. Mm -hmm. If liability goes up sharply, your net financial asset yeah, will drop. Agreed. Now, what are Indians doing with an increased net financial liability? It is possible they're taking housing loans and investing in physical Absolutely. assets. Uh, it is possible they're taking personal loans and traveling. Right? So, these questions will need to be answered. And this Indians is just are traveling a lot more. Yes. Yes, so the so savings rates have also been uh, dropped from 33% to what, 25? It's dropped and this is typical of hmm. a growing economy, economy. Right? A, a more ambitious okay. uh, economy, right? I'm willing okay. to spend more. Okay, now let's talk about wealth and yes. income oh, inequality. Interesting. Uh, you call it the rise of the billionaire Raj, you refer to the people who titled that. Yes. Uh, it's a book called Income and Wealth it's Inequality report, in India, yes. uh, 20, 1922 to 23. Yes. Uh, it has a famous writer Thomas Piketty in it. Uh, you know, some of them would call him. A, you know, a lot of the capitalists don't like <laughs> him, but that's okay. But there are other people like Nitin Kumar Bharti and Lucas uh, Chansal who's uh, written this report. It's called the Income and Wealth Inequality yeah. uh, in India Report, and that's what you refer to. So, wh what do you want to talk about income e inequality? Here? If, for example, you say if you earn rupees one lakh a month, you are in the top ten percent of India's earners. You yeah. mentioned that. You know, bottom 50% earns rupees 200 per day. Top 0.001% earn rupees 13 lakhs per day. Per day. Yeah. That's probably 1 million people, 100,000 people, no, I think. 10,000? 10,000 yeah. 10, people, yes. correct. 10,000 people earn 13 lakhs. Who are those 10,000 people? <laughs> Please come and do a podcast with me. Please sponsor me. You know, I would love to uh, really make you feel happy. But, okay, jokes apart. Top two Asia's richest are Indians. This is very interesting. Uh, Go on. Top so two Asia's richest are Indians. The, okay. the top three richest mm -hmm. Asians, mm -hmm. who are Indians. Okay. One is, the third is a Chinese. Okay. But China's GDP is mm. five times of India. That's interesting. And they have only... So, but they have the richest is third. Mm. And India has the two top richest, despite being 20% of China's GDP. Yeah. Right? So it is an indication of the concentration of wealth. Mm. Right? Now, is that a problem unique to India? No. Mm. Other countries and the wealth inequality is even worse. You mm. have something called the Gini coefficient. Yes. You should talk about the inequality. The uh, that gives you an indicator. And there's a world map too. Right? Okay. In the PDF. 
according to you, the Gini coefficient of India is 0.33. It is more equal than US, you say. It's more equal than China, but less equal than Germany and France. In what way? So if you look at the Gini coefficient, uh, India is 0.33. If you look at Germany and France, it is 0.31, 0.32. And uh, basically, Gini coefficient is between 0 to 1. Right? If it is 0, then it is perfectly equal. If it is 1, it is perfectly unequal. <laughs> so the closer you are to 0, which means you're in a more equitable society. right? Uh, so India is definitely more equal compared to China. China is 0.37. Uh, US is close to 0.3738. So yeah. we are more equal because maybe US and China have a lot more wealthy people yeah. and a lot more destitutes. Uh, right? The so income g- g- gap divide is there is massive, a lot. Right? So, the gap is massive yes. in those countries. Great. So it's true. For those of you complaining that we see many Indians in the flights, it's true, unfortunately. 1% of Indians take 45% of all flights. Yeah. 2.6% of Indians invest in mutual funds. 6.5% of users are responsible for 44% of UPI transactions. That means it's an urban phenomenon. It is an urban phenomenon. But I see UPI across even across, rural regions. But the question is the volume and mm-hmm. the quantum, mm-hmm. correct? So if you look at, again, disparity, you're looking at how it is... Con- if you're looking at 1% of Indians using 45% of a flight, mm-hmm. you, you know, these are staggering numbers because of our population, right? We have a mm-hmm. massive population. So 99% of Indians either may not travel in a flight or are contributing to the remaining 55. Yeah, I got it. Given the size of our population, these mm-hmm. are massive numbers, right? Yeah. Of course, like I said, this is not unique to India. Mm-hmm. Other countries have it worse, right? Uh, wealth inequality will be there. Income inequality will be there. There's very little that you can do unless there's an intervention from a tax perspective. If you look at what you've said earlier, that only the poverty is 3 to 4%. Real poor people are only 3 to 4%. And that I'm thinking when I look at India from the 80s to now, we have really done very well. We have done well, yes. So there's no point in complaining we have, no, we have by all the well, socialists yeah. and communists out there that, that the capitalists are eating yeah. up the country and all that. Yes, I care about the environment. We have to touch on the environment. What do you think? We will come to that. There's a climate change piece. Yes. And... Uh, Th- that's another so, so let's uh, conclude this yes. uh, wealth, so, and, wealth inequality thing quickly. Correct. So wealth we have discussed. Yes. Uh, sorry, income we have discussed. Yes. If you look at wealth, hmm. again, huge uh, difference. If you see 87% of uh, India's wealth is locked up in immobile property, hmm. 10 in financial assets. Mostly that will grow with time. But what is interesting is that 1% of India hmm. owns 40% of the national wealth. 1% of Indians? Indians. Own? 40% of the total wealth okay. that is available, right? Yeah. So that is how big the gap is. And the last And piece, define national wealth quickly. For so them. basically assets, value of assets that you own. So they if I add land, up all the land, the gold, the financial cap, assets, everything, yes. Yeah, correct. So if you add up all of that, 40% of that is in the hands of 1% of yeah. India. Would it be fair to say that we're living in their charity at this point of time? Maybe. Maybe? Okay, yeah. maybe, maybe. Okay, great. Yeah. So but again, India is still aspiring. We are going yes. to grow. Yes. Uh, 92 million can become 200 million. A lot of people will say that no, Indians are, there are 350 million uh, middle class today because they have TVs, they have internet. But you're defining it by money. If you have money, money. that's what defines everything. Correct. So today it's only 92 million that are between, that earn more than 12 lakhs a year, perhaps. Yeah, it right? should increase. And it should time. increase yes. with time. So, okay. Significant difference between data points. You looked yeah. at the world inequality lab. Correct. And, and the, the price. price report, yeah. And the price report. The price report goes on to say that by 2021, or so if you look at 2021 number. and if you look at the 22 23 mm. there shouldn't be a much there shouldn't be a large difference Correct. in these two years but if you see the definition of middle class and aspirers what the price report refers to and what the world inequality mm. lab refers to mm. i am not able to wrap my head around these numbers mm. because the gap is huge got it uh, maybe some of your viewers would be able to point us in the right direction but if you see some other reports too sbi mm. research has a report there are a lot of differences in data points, right? Mm. World Inequality Report explains how they have arrived at these numbers. Mm. It's an interesting read. And they've looked at various data points, mm. right? So I'll share links to that as well. Yes, right? okay. So that, you know... Uh, I think so. We share watching. as much detail to the uh, to the people watching in because they're the ones who are going to vote okay. in a week. Yes. So great. Now, challenges to India's growth story. We've covered yeah. taxes. We've covered in- India's wealth. A lot of people growing, you know, all claps to them. And uh, we will add more people in the middle class even better. But now, challenges to the India growth story right. is my favorite subject. Uh, are we going to do a 10% growth in GDP? 10 may be a stretch. Uh, mm-hmm. We are expecting somewhere close to 7, mm-hmm. slightly more than 7, which is also very good. Right? Mm-hmm. We are the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, if you look at the last quarter, uh, we have grown at close to 8. 8.4 is mm-hmm. what some estimates say. Mm-hmm. But again, 
we have to go deeper into these numbers, right? If you look at agriculture, agriculture shrunk. Hmm. If you look at manufacturing, it's doing well. If hmm. you look at services, you're doing well. Uh, agriculture shrunk because of unseasonal rainfall and yeah. in some places deficit. Hmm. Again, that is linked to a climate change. We'll be hmm. linking these two. But the growth has primarily been led by manufacturing hmm. and it, is, it could also be because of the government's PLI incentives, right? production linked incentives. Hmm. So maybe they are yielding fruit, but in the next two years, at least, the expectation we should be growing close to 7%. And I, re I really hope it rains in the south I or north so. or yeah. wherever, in the east and west in India, because this year has been is. terribly odd. We're getting into the weather in a bit, the weather report, not yes. the band, but, but definitely the details on how the weather is going to affect our, in, in our income and whatever that happens in the future in this country. Right, unemployment. We've yeah. always close to 8 to 9%. That's been, a, that's been what, we've 11, I think, at some stage. We're we've, done, uh, we've done well, but at least the last year, 2023, mm -hmm. you've seen a steady rise. You know, it's gone up to 8. It used mm -hmm. to be closer to 7. A small increase, but we've done very well from where we were during COVID times. But that's not the point. The point mm -hmm. is uh, something far more uh, darker, right? which is the graduates. Mm -hmm. Fresh graduates, aged mm. less than 25 years, 45% mm. of them are unemployed. Interesting. So graduates Interesting. To, who've just come out of college are yeah. just not getting jobs. Yeah, so they may be doing informal jobs, like delivery they boys and all that. Doing, yeah. right? So yeah, possibly they're in the unorganized sector. Yeah, and right? the Congress, I'm going to say, forget the party. Regardless of the party, Congress, RBJP, that's what they say, that they'll give freebies there. That's not a good but idea. Is the, yeah, the question is... Of what use is it, right? You should be creating jobs, right? And if graduates are not getting jobs after having spent a lot of time mm -hmm. studying, mm -hmm. then the question is, uh, where will they spend? So the household expenditure that we spoke mm -hmm. about, uh, middle class growing, a market being created, mm -hmm. unless they get jobs, unless they have money in their pocket, where is the question of all of this? Happening? Do you think they're unemployed because they're not, either, again, uh, unemployable because of technological changes? Yeah, so there are two things, right? Mm -hmm. Unemployed and unemployable, mm -hmm. correct? So if you look at a large majority of sure. the youth or, or for graduates, 60% mm. of them are not employable. Sure. Now the fact is 45% uh, of them are not even getting jobs. Forget about being employable, mm. right? Now with the change in technology with say artificial intelligence taking over, it is very clear the direction that it's okay. going. Every year you're going to see some significant change. Okay. What will happen to these jobs? Because we are heavily reliant on the services industry to absorb talent, mm. right? At least talent, formal sector. If technology is going to take that mm. space over and you're seeing layoffs, you're seeing mm. layoffs across the world because technology is able to do mm. things better. What happens to these guys, right? If you look at the um, the difference between states again, it is, it's quite an irony that states which have higher, um, mm. em higher uh, unemployment also have higher graduates. Yeah. So a state and the better is, HDI. In many a state ways. that is investing more in education is getting graduates out. Is unfortunately also facing a higher unemployment rate. So is it because those who study go away out of the state. No, no, they are they're there. Of course, they may go away mm -hmm. to search for jobs, right? But if you're looking at people who are remaining. Yeah, and, and this is interesting. Them. States like Goa, Kerala, and Punjab have higher than average Correct. unemployment rates. If you look at UP, has a lower unemployment rate than Kerala. That's a uh, now. That is seems UP like an irony and contradiction. Exactly. To me. Now, is UP able to absorb its youth mm. in the informal sector? Mm. Correct. Mm. Well, if you look at southern states, maybe you're creating a lot of uh, engineers. You're creating people who are very good in coding. Mm. Now, that could be a massive asset base to us, provided you have jobs. Mm. And this straight away goes into your investment in education. Yeah. And I think you uh, need to upskill them. You I think need, we need to, to upskill, divert yeah. resources to upskill them. Mm. Otherwise, you cannot have. A popular, yeah. our median age, India's median age is 28, 20, 28, 27, 28 mm. years, right? You're looking at 50% of India's population, which is below the age of 30. They're not getting jobs. Yeah, and the NEP or the National Education Policy recommends that 6% of GDP should be allocated. Yeah, that's this stands education. at only 3 yeah. to 4%. And the proposed higher education budget in financial year 25, 2025 is lower by 18%. 18%. It's the same across the world. Educa there's less spent on education, there's more spent on defense and defense-related research. Correct. And there's less spent on healthcare. We are not even getting there yet. So, what it's, should be done? It's, it's very sad. If you see these numbers, mm. uh, if you see the amount of money that the government of India has contributed this year to IITs, which has been celebrated mm. because it's one of the highest. Correct. It's and most of the to, IITs don't stay here sometimes. Yeah, the but US, they are 1.2 right? billion. Yeah, government of India allocates 1.2 billion, yes. Harvard's annual expenditure 
is six billion. Yeah, is it because that, is it because of the private nature of that? Whatever it is, I'm just mm. saying that the amount of money that we should be spending. Hmm. See, we don't have a lot of money. Yes, we covered this in our budget session, yeah, right? The previous one. I'll put a link yeah, to that too. Indians have don't have a lot of a lot money, of money sure. right? As as a nation, so hmm. we can only spend so much. Now the question is, if your own arm, say hmm. the national education policy, is saying that hmm. spend at least six percent, hmm. but you go and drop the investment in education, so you're not going to invest in the youth, and these your current population is any anyway facing an unemployment crisis. Hmm. You're looking at 85%. There's another number. 85% of unemployed people are below the age of 30. Now you're not even giving them the tools. You're not mm. even investing in the infrastructure. Because if you see the speed with which technology is changing, do you mm. honestly believe that our current infrastructure of colleges, teachers, can teach students how AI works? No. And no. you're anyway cutting that budget. So oh, what yeah, is going right. to happen to graduates? You have you know, 12, 30 million you know, people graduating every year. Mm. Where do they get jobs? It's interesting. It is uh, difficult to combine that now with, it's true, one is uh, taxes being collected and where they're being spent. Second, we talked about income equality. Incomes are growing at some level, uh, but in some level they're just stagnant. It's funny that uh, certain items are growing, certain items of consumption are not growing, like cereals and vegetables. Okay. It's okay. dropping. It's interesting. And therefore, it's funny, somebody told me the other day that uh, Indians are not learning how to cook anymore. On their own, that means they're consuming outside a lot more. It's interesting. That means the nutrition levels may be going down. And then you talk about education, which yeah. is all dreary to me. Where the allocations are bad, where where Harvard alone, uh, Harvard alone as an institution spends six Five billion, times. whereas there are about ten ten IITs or more. Yeah, more. And, more. You, the and they get only one point two billion. Not spending enough on education. Where you see any, any on the science government also. that is saying that I'm willing to give freebies mm. and not investing in education. Yes. You are, there should be red flags in your mind. And let's talk about the climate change, which is an ultimate nail in the coffin, or it's going to bury me or burn me, right? And it's a natural heat wave. So let's see. There's heat waves. Yeah. There's landslides in the Himalayas. The heat waves, of course, in Rajasthan. You know, you know, the Himalayas, landslides, cloud bursts, melting glaciers, right? And the Gangetic Plain, there's floods. We have seen that. The coastal plains and guts, heavy precipitation, cyclones, landslides again, and central peninsular region, forest fires, and there are heat waves and droughts. And in our city, we don't have groundwater. I wrote about this 20 years ago, but then I was a little man, so little man, I mean, we don't matter actually when we write those things. But yes, if you have to dig in Bangalore, you have to go below 1,000 feet or more, and there's no groundwater. So I want to bring about bring up two, three points. Right? Yes. One, of course, the average annual temperature has been increasing. Mm. Everybody knows that. There's no debate about climate change. Mm. It's stupidity to debate climate change. Yes. Second, if you look at, now let us tie climate change to employment. Hmm. A large percentage of our population works outdoors hmm. because you're not getting formal jobs. You're in the informal sector. Either agriculture, construction absorbs you yes. uh, or you're doing some informal job. Again, you're on the street. Hmm. Right? And this includes a large population of our youth. Yeah, that is basically saying significant, significant portion of our population has to work in the is heat. Is exposed basically yeah. to the heat, right? If climate change, not if, sorry, as, climb, as the temperatures increase, it is certainly going to impact our workforce far worse than other countries, right? Mm. Because you've got a large population that is exposed, you know, to this heat. If you're, if they are not able to work at their optimum levels, right? Yeah. Now the question is, how how much longer would they be even able to work? And the and the fact is, some funny startup looking at this cannot say that I'll bring robotics into the fields and farms. I, you know, I it's a good know, business yeah. opportunity, maybe. But to be honest, it's a bit of a pipe dream in India at this point of time with the farms and the fa farm holdings that we have. Some are doing it. Uh, yes, in uh, I say Sirsi, we have an office in Sirsi, mm -hmm. and people are experimenting with drones. It's interesting. For spraying. Yeah, the question is what happens to Spraying the, pesticides, right? Yeah. Mm. What happens to the labor, mm. right? And this is the same with any technology. But the fact is, if you look at climate change, mm. climate change is here. It is going to get worse. Mm. Uh, I think Karnataka is facing a drought, right? mm. one of the worst droughts that it has ever faced. And what that will lead to is erratic food supplies. Erratic food supply will mean higher food inflation. So mm. things will get expensive. Now let us combine these things together. Climate change higher food inflation and unemployment. You don't have money to buy food. It puts a lot of pressure on the government. And India's food inflation has anyway been it's high. It's very high. It's 8%. 8%, it yes. 8%, which puts pressure on the government now to give money away or give food away hmm. as subsidies. Hmm. Again, the question is where will that money come from? It should come from taxes, but nobody's employed. So who's going to earn and pay? 
companies have to pay. Yeah. But companies are paying 5% lower tax than what you and I pay. Mm. Right? So if companies are going to get that benefit, yeah, people like us will suffer. And the government wants to borrow to keep people... You they know, will borrow because it's inevitable. And to pay people, is it? There's no see you ultimately. To pay borrow. people to it's a freebie, right? Then it's inevitable. You have to borrow because if the tax revenues are not per your expectations, you have to borrow. Oh, and are you saying now we have to give freebies? I, I think you have to define again. You get need versus necessity. Yes. If it is a necessity, see. If Do it with a necessity. Because, uh, but then, youth is not a ne- youth is a necessity for training. Yes. And invest in the training. Yes. That's a necessity, not, not in making them sitting at home. Not so the maybe the farmers dollar. who, uh, but I think farmers will have will need a they, lot of help now. They will need a lot of help, yeah. especially because of climate change. Yes. So we have to relook at our budgets. Hmm. So when you say free B, you know, giving money to a farmer hmm. may not be that bad an idea because if they are the ones on the field hmm. and they are facing erratic climate. Hmm. They will protest or commit suicide, right? Hmm. What is the option available to a farmer? Okay, it's so interesting. It's like a science fiction thing, guys. See, the states with higher literacy, where you know, you're, now I want to move from the. I know climate change is really bad, and uh, we don't have time, so we have to cover so much yeah. quickly, guys. With all this affecting you, you'll have to look at certain points that are certainly very stark and scary. States with higher literacy, yeah, will have lower fertility. It is a reality. It's scary. It is. It's, it is, worldwide. it's worldwide. It's worldwide. Okay, just like America now, yeah. right? In many ways, right? And or Europe in many of the countries yeah, in Europe, same problem, worldwide. right? Yeah. And you know, I'll just want why to would you want to talk about? Yeah, I please want go to on. Add a point there, right? Yes, it's a bigger problem in India. Mm-hmm. So if our population continues to grow the way it is, we better do something. And you have a climate change crisis. Yeah. You have an unemployment crisis, right? If yeah. you combine all of this. You cannot sustain that population. Then what happens to these people mm. who are not getting jobs, who don't have money? The other problem to this, I don't know if I have to bring it up, but Please bring it you up. also have it's a social media crisis, right? Where yeah. people I'm are consuming. portraying yeah. a certain lifestyle. So there's obviously ambition, right? Mm. If someone's buying a new car and posting that, why can't I do it, but I don't have a job? I don't have the means, neither do I understand how to do it. I don't even have food to eat mm. because I can't afford food, Right. So what are we staring at? So we, if the population just keeps increasing this way, uh, it is going to be madness. Pawan, again, so much. We're running out of time, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes we're talking about uh, 16 lakh startups at this point of time. No, That's no, 1.2 lakh 1. startups. 1. 1. 1.2 lakh registered. 1.2 lakh registered startups. Mm-hmm. About 16 lakh active companies. Okay. And the active companies are those who are, who are filing their returns basically with uh-huh. the MCA. Okay. So if you look at startups, again, the hope is that they would be the employment. Okay, now 1.2 lakh startups, mm-hmm. but 16 lakhs are active companies. Correct. That means that's additional to 1.2? Correct. So these are mm-hmm. so 1.2 is a subset okay. of the 16 mm-hmm. lakh, right? Now, mm-hmm. startups could also be LLPs for a fraction, but... But the registrations of startups are going up, right? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. yes. Many of them are not yet registered. They are all registered either mm-hmm. as companies or mm-hmm. as LLPs, mm-hmm. and they apply for recognition from the startup. Okay. Dot GOV, there's a website. This is interesting. And then I really want to talk about, you know, you summarizing. You have to touch about FDI inflows. FDI inflows they have are dropped. huge. No, they, they have dropped, dropped to the startup Last side. I know, years. $54 billion for startups has dropped to $11 billion. Yeah. Uh, Not just startups, but overall, if you see the last two years, mm. the FDI inflow has dropped. Mm. Maybe it's dropped worldwide mm. because we are, the world is being more cautious. Mm. What's happening in Ukraine? Mm. What's happening now in the Middle East? Mm. Now, that's another angle which we don't even know how it will play out in the mm. future, right? With the Middle East boiling up now. Yes. How does it impact India? Because your oil supplies are impacted. Yeah, Middle East, right? uh, I mean, the Iran Israel thing, our so Israel that's another, Palestine thing, yeah, we don't know or the Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine thing. Correct. Russia and Ukraine has always been beat for free. Correct. Right? And uh, this is oil. And oil side. side, yes. Right? So that's. But the good thing is India is only dependent on the oil side. Which right? is one of our major costs, mm. if yeah. you see. That is what we spend a lot on. Uh, At least the wheat side is our. It's all self sufficient. So that's not a problem. Right. Uh, we, imp- we export, not actually. If. So that's good. But oil will be a problem for us. In addition to that, we are also heavily dependent on coal for our energy resources. Mm. Close to 70% of our energy is met by coal. Mm. Combine that with climate change now. Because what will happen with climate change is that you're more dependent what, on... 60% of our energy comes from coal, no? 70, yeah. close to 70 okay. now, right? The your goal is to move that to renewable energy. Yeah. But now here's the problem. With erratic climate, you will start consuming more energy, obviously. Yeah. You'll have fans running, ACs running. To make that function, you need to have a lot of coal reserves, which will be burnt now, which again contributes to, to this, climate change. To climate change. Right? So, and temperature increase. Yeah. I know, I mean, fascinating podcast. We've all... Like I said, in 10 years, India has changed. We dress differently. We aspire differently. A lot of people have moved away from 
poverty, and not lightly, I'm not saying this lightly, India has done really well over the last 25 years, especially the last 10 years, it's youth power. But, but like he said, the youth needs to be trained, yeah. skilled, no freebies to them, please, any government. Yeah. Taxes are being collected. The center versus state problem is, re is really covered it very well. Thank you, Pawn, for that. Uh, oh, it's always the case, right? Uh, states that are doing well will always ask for more. It's the same in, in the U.S. to win the schooling system. The schools that give the best grades ask for the best, uh, ask the government Correct. to pay them more. But here you can't do that because there are certain pockets yeah. of India that are really very poor. Therefore, the central government is moving it is money there. Natural, yeah. It, it is that natural. Happen. And um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I may have come across as someone very cynical in this. Interview. You're not cynical. You're being but practical. Data, is, data doesn't lie. Yeah. Uh, youth don't lie in their capacity to do great things. But please don't uh, visit your local bar. Instead, visit uh, <laughs> visit your uh, local library. library. If there is a library, digital library, <laughs> use your smartphone wisely. Yeah. And uh, maybe we're getting old to say that, <laughs> right? Okay, but we're not old, guys. I'm telling you, go change India. India is rising. But again, ideas are needed. Climate change is real in India. Yeah. Invest in uh, things that really will, well, go have your cereals and vegetables. Invest in that. Invest in things that make your lives better and lessen the consumption of packaged food because it's really not good for your gut. We all know that as we have aged again. Again, revealing our age. We're not that old. By the way, enjoy this podcast. Give questions. This entire interview's reports, the beautifully you know, yeah, curated report. We're going to put it up in the BCL website, in yeah. the Upstream Live website. Uh, we'll try to make a video of the slides also. Yeah, we'll try. We'll just release that too. Sure. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, Pawan. So Thank you. Thank you.